And Martin is going to continue with his lecture. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming back. Um, oh yeah, just maybe before I start, actually, uh, yesterday there was some sort of discussion about the question whether Wilson loop observables really determine gauge orbits or not. Um, actually, Ilya Shevirev this morning sent me an email with a reference. So there's a paper by Sengupta in 94. So maybe I can put the link on the web page then, uh, where he proves that for most of the standard league groups, it is the case that the um, that Wilson loop observables uniquely determine the gauge orbits. In general, it's not true. He gives a counterexample, or he gives a couple of counterexamples, I think. All the counterexamples are either with compact Lie groups, uh, with non-compact Lie groups, or with, in some sense, sort of cheating, in the sense that you, you reduce everything to the discrete case by doing, well, something along the lines of what uh, Max was mentioning where the problem actually comes from the fact that your, uh, your space of loops is not, uh, not connected. So if the manifold, the base manifold is not simply connected, uh, then you can essentially reduce things to a case of finite groups. And then you have some finite groups that allow you to generate counterexamples. Um, it's not known whether it holds in general, like for all say connected compact Lie groups. Uh, so his proof covers most of the classical ones, but for example, it doesn't cover SON for even N bigger than four for some reason. Um, and it covers all the other ones that you know somehow, except if you're an expert and then you know crazy ones and it doesn't cover those. Um, okay, so, so what I wanted to do today, remember yesterday we derived that um, sort of stochastic young Mills equation, which I thought, so that was the last slide yesterday, which is essentially a gradient flow for the young Mills energy. So the first term here is really just a gradient flow for the young Mills energy. Um, and then there is this noise term, which formally is supposed to be such that formally the invariant measure for that guy should be e to the minus young Mills energy. And then we saw that this equation here is not actually parabolic because this is in a space of forms. Uh, and this guy, the dominant term is something like a D star D, which is not actually an elliptic operator. Um, but then we saw you can actually add a term to the right-hand side, which in some sense moves locally, just moves in directions that are tangent to the gauge orbit at the point A. Um, and so, at least formally, it shouldn't change anything if you only care about gauge invariant observables. Okay. Uh, so you can think of this also as being some sort of dynamical form of gauge fixing or something like that. Um, okay, and then if you, if you choose this term correctly, so we saw that in principle here, you can add any term that's of the form covariant derivative of something. And so here you could choose anything, any sort of scalar, uh, scalar valued function that sort of depends on A locally, say. Um, and well, one natural choice is to just put D star A here. Um, and then that guarantees that the dominant term is now D star D plus D D star, and that is an elliptic operator. Okay. Uh, so that's just the Laplacian. And then there's extra terms. So, so let me actually just so you see it, uh, let me actually write down the equation explicitly rather than sort of in fancy notation. Uh, so if you write it explicitly, then what this equation is, is really just this. Uh, so you have the Laplacian as just mentioned. And then there's a term which is a Lie bracket of AJ with two times the partial derivative in the j direction of ai minus the partial derivative in the i direction of aj plus uh, the Lie bracket between aj and ai and then 
close the Lie bracket and then plus the noise. Okay, and so now again, uh, AI of say T and X belongs to the Lie algebra uh, and the Xi i's uh, sort of frac G valued uh, space time white noises. All right, so formally, if you want the uh, um, expectation expectation of say uh, G1 Xi I of Tx times G2 Xi I of Sy is equal to in a product between G1 and G2 times delta T minus S times delta X minus Y uh, where here this inner product is an inner product on uh, on the Lie algebra and it's the inner product which is invariant um, which gives you a norm that's invariant under conjugation okay and there's that uniquely it uniquely determines it sort of up to a factor uh, yeah Hendrik did you I'm, I'm just wondering uh, I mean in principle could you make your life easier by taking a noise that doesn't act into the ten, into the directions where the uh, where the gauge group or stays invariant taking Right. Yeah. So you could, um, that's a good question. So at least formally, right, as Hendrik says, you could also, in some sense, cancel out, you could try to cancel out somehow the contribution of the noise that goes in this direction, because you don't care about that and only keep the contribution in that direction. Um, I don't think it makes it easier. I mean, it would just make the equation multiplicative instead of additive and which just look more horrible somehow. I mean, it wouldn't really make any, right? It wouldn't really make that part of the equation simpler. Um, and it would just make that part sort of look ugly also. <laughs> so I don't think it would sort of simplify things much. But I mean, it could possibly make, you had this shift of uh, shift of gauge that was sort of implicit in your other thing. If you wanted to undo that, that would probably- Right, yeah, okay. So you could ask yourself the question if, right, if something like that or, yeah. So if, for example, the solution to this equation, as I wrote, is gauge equivalent in some sense uh, to the solution of the equation that Hendrik wants to write down, not clear at all somehow mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's the sort of add invariant uh, scalar product on the Lie algebra okay so that's uh now this equation is sort of our object of study if you want um now just one remark in terms of power counting and so on, um, it really sort of looks like phi four, right? So phi four would be something like DT phi equal to Laplacian phi minus phi cube plus noise. Okay, so here you do actually have a cubic term, right? So this term here is cubic in A. Uh, and it's just that, you know, it doesn't take values in R, but in the Lie algebra. And so this is some cubic function on the Lie algebra, okay? But it's a homogeneous cubic function on the Lie algebra. Uh, and then there's an additional term, which is this one, which in some sense looks more like a transport pipe term, or like, you know, something like, a, I mean, Navier-Stokes would have that type of power counting, right? Um, and both Phi-4 and Navier-Stokes are sort of subcritical in dimensions less than four and critical in dimension four and then supercritical in dimensions above four. Um, and therefore the same is true for that equation, right? So, the, so this equation is subcritical for dimension in dimension less than four. Okay, so in particular in dimensions two and three, 
one should be able to give a meaning to this, right? So I'm not going to talk much about how you actually give a meaning to this equation. Um, in the last lecture on Friday, I'm going to discuss a little bit at the start of the lecture, basically like just a black box type of result, right? So like just what does the actual statement of the type of results that give a meaning to this equation look like? Okay, so the statement is essentially, well, the equation is problematic because that white, white noise term here is very rough. And so it's not clear a priori what these nonlinear terms mean. And so what you want to do is you smoothen that guy out. So you essentially replace these delta functions by approximate delta functions. That gives you something smooth. Um, so now there's no problem in solving it. Um, and then you try to pass to the limit. But the problem that we'll see is that when you try to do that, then in general, you actually have to add counter terms to this equation. Um, there's a question. It, yes. There's a question in the chat. Oh, there's a question. Criticality in which sense? Yes, scaling behavior. So in the sense, uh, I think Nicholas uh, mentioned in his lecture. So it's criticality in the same sense as in Nicholas lectures. So in the sense that formally, if you just rescale, if you do a parabolic rescaling, which keeps that bit invariant and the noise invariant, so there's a one parameter family of scalings that somehow keeps the linear equation invariant, then under that family of scaling, formally, this guy disappears if you zoom into small scales. Okay, and it blows up if you zoom out to large scales. Okay, so then that's what subcritical would mean in this context. Um, okay, so, so then what we're going to discuss on Friday is somehow the problem that, well, this equation in some formal sense, if you just do formal calculation, it looks like it should be gauge invariant or at least gauge equivariant in the sense that if you start uh, with two initial conditions on the same gauge orbit, so two initial conditions that, you know, differ only by a gauge transformation, uh, and you solve the equation for both of them, then at least in law, the two solutions, again, should only differ by a gauge transformation, random gauge transformation. Um, but now if you start to, you know, add counter terms here, well, that would break gauge invariance, gauge equivariance in general. But on the other hand, smoothening out that noise actually also breaks gauge equivariance. Right? So somehow the, uh, the mechanism by which you give a meaning to the equation is in a way not really very well adapted to the whole philosophy in gauge theory, right? Because you want to keep everything sort of gauge invariant or gauge equivariant. Uh, and here the philosophy to build solutions is to mollify that noise, add some counter terms, pass to the limit, and then you know, prove that you, you can actually get limits if you choose the counter terms in the right way. Um, the problem here is that both the operation of mollifying the noise and the operation of adding counter terms both break, break gauge invariance in general. Okay? Uh, and so what we're seeing in the last lecture is that you know, by miracle, there's exactly one way of doing it so that in the limit, there is a notion of solution and the solution is actually gauge invariant. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of the main result that we're heading towards um, in the last lecture. Uh, but what I want to discuss today is the question of, you know, what is a good state space for the solutions? Okay, so so what sort of, you know, what's your space of connections um, on which you would want to formulate that equation, right? So a state space for solutions. Um, and so maybe the first thing we should do is to look at the just the linear equation right so the linear at the linear level um, so we have just dta is equal to 
Laplacian A plus white noise. Uh, for KPZ, there's a way to modify that keeps white noise invariance. Um, yeah, okay, so that's a good question. I don't know. So in the physics literature, people did that. So there are papers in the physics literature um, where they, you know, they make exactly Milton's remark. They say, well, if you do the, if you do stochastic quantization, you get that SPD, which formally is gauge invariant, but then you want to have a notion of solution. So you would want to do some kind of modification pass to the limit. And so you'd want to keep gauge invariance in your modification. Now, what they do is that they then say, oh, a nonlinear way of mollifying things is to actually just look at um, the deterministic part of the equation, right? So if I just look at this part of the equation, so if you want just the gradient flow for young mills, that gives me some kind of mollifying, right? So the solution map to that gives me some sort of a modifier um, which respects gauge equivariance, but which is not linear, okay? And so then they just sort of formally apply that to the whole equation. Uh, but then you again end up with a noise term that becomes multiplicative. The whole thing becomes super messy. Um, and it's really not that clear if that helps. So yeah, but I, I don't know of any simple way of mollifying the equation that respects gauge invariance. Um, so at the Okay, so at the linear level, if you just look at the solution to stochastic heat equation, um, so let me just you know, show you a little calculation uh, that tells you what kind of space the solutions to that equation live in. Okay, so maybe most of you have seen that calculation, uh, but some of you haven't. Um, so, so let me just yeah. Okay, so let me just check first what, or maybe I just postulate, you know, I'm just going to claim um, that the noise itself, so white noise, that's a claim, is that white noise in general on Rd belongs to C minus D over two minus. Now, what does that mean? Well, for d equal one, it's clear, right? Because in d equal one, white noise formally is the derivative of Brownian motion. Brownian motion has sample paths that belong to C one half, or not quite C one half, but they belong to every Hilbert space uh, of regularity just less than a half. And so at least formally, if you differentiate something which is in C one half, while well, differentiating makes you lose one degree of regularity. So you should end up with something in C minus a half. So you can define C minus a half as just being, you know, things that are the derivative of something which is in C plus a half. Um, in general, you know, you can define these negative uh, Helder spaces by behavior. So they would be spaces of distributions and you can define them by sort of the behavior uh, that you see when you test them against test functions that are, you know, like approximate delta functions. Or you could, for example, define them um, in Rn in a similar way to what I just did in R1 by saying, well, they are, you know, holder spaces of positive degree to which I applied, you know, some power of a Laplacian, right? I just postulate that the Laplacian sort of decreases degree by two. Uh, and so I just apply you know, as many Laplacians that I need to reach the ex negative exponent that I want. Okay, so that all gives the same definition. Okay. So there's a sort of reasonable definition of negative holder spaces. Now in our case, this is not just on space, it's on space time. Okay, so on R times Rd. Now, of course you would say, well, R times Rd is really just Rd plus one. Uh, I can't really argue against that, but I will try to argue against it anyway. Um, 
The point being here that in terms of scaling, you want the time direction to scale differently from the space direction. Okay, and that's uh, due to the fact that the equation we're looking, we're interested in is this equation here, um, where at the linear level, we have two space derivatives on the right, but only one time derivative on the left. So the natural scaling, which keeps this equation invariant is a scaling where if I rescale space by some factor lambda, then I have to rescale time by lambda square right, to, to make the equation invariant. So the parabolic rescaling would be one where you rescale space by lambda, but time by lambda square. Um, and there is a natural way of defining these Hilda spaces in terms of, again, you know, how distributions behave when you test them against test function that approximate delta functions, but this time you approximate a delta function by something that you rescale in that inhomogeneous way. So you have like a epsilon approximation in space, but epsilon square approximation in time. Okay. Uh, and if you do that, then it's essentially as if that copy of R counted double. Okay, so it's as if that copy of R was really kind of secretly some copy of R2. Um, and so that guy with parabolic scaling belongs to well, C minus D plus two over two minus, okay, not D plus one. Um, and then Schauder says that if Xi belongs to C alpha and A solves the linear, that, uh, that inhomogeneous heat equation with right hand side given by Xi, then um, A belongs to C alpha plus two, okay? And again, in both cases, you really have to measure regularity in this parabolic sense, where time is treated a bit differently from space. Um, so solving the heat equation makes you gain two degrees of regularity, which is not surprising. Uh, so it's a little bit like, you know, if you forget about the DT and you just have the Poisson equation, then of course it's clear that you gain two degrees of regularity. Okay, but it's also true for the heat equation if you measure regularity in the correct way. Um, and so in our case, alpha is um, minus d over two minus one. And so if, you, if we gain two, um, well, that means that we end up in C one minus d over two, well, minus, okay. So you see there's a change in behavior at d equal two. So for d less than two, you have something positive. So in dimension one, you get a half. So the solution to this equation is a function of holder regularity a half. But already in dimension two, uh, you end up with a solution to this equation, which is actually a distribution of, you know, regularity sort of zero, zero minus. So it's somehow, just about not a function. And then in dimension three, you end up with a distribution of regularity basically minus a half. In dimension four, you end up with a distribution of regularity minus one, et cetera. Okay, and it, gets, it goes worse and worse as you go to a higher and higher dimension. Um, and so already in, even in dimension two, that means that it's actually not that clear um, you know, what would be a good state space? Because of course you could just say, well, okay, I take this as my state space, right? So I want, so it's not unreasonable to expect that the solution to this equation here, since it's essentially a heat equation plus a whole bunch of stuff, which at small scales is dominated by the heat equation. Um, so in terms of regularity, you expect the solution to this equation to look like the solution to that equation um, and so therefore it's not unreasonable to say, well, in that case, well, I have a natural state space, which is just, you know, that space here, one of these negative holder spaces. The problem with that is that, well, 
you know, we have a very natural class of observables in these gauge theories, which are these Wilson loop observables, right? And we've seen in all the discussions up to now, holonomy has played a very important role. Um, but now in order to define a holonomy, you want to basically be able to solve that ODE, right? So, in the, so the holonomies, they were essentially solutions. Hold on, uh, they were sort of solutions to an ODE of the form sort of DF is equal to F times um, sort of DA. So it was A of like D gamma, if you follow, or maybe I shouldn't use gamma because I used gamma for the connection. Of da, right? Where the where the little a would be some path in your configuration space, uh, and then this is this a. Whoops. Uh, this a is a one form, right? So you feed it sort of an infinitesimal direction that gives you an element in the Lie algebra. That guy is a guy in the Lie group. That gives you a differential equation with values in the Lie group. So you want to be able to somehow solve equations of that type. Um, but if you want to be able to solve equations of that type, that means that you want to be able to restrict A, uh, capital A, to the curve little a. Right? So this guy really only depends on what happens on the curve little a. But now these spaces, when the exponent is negative here, they are spaces of distributions. Um, so in general, you cannot really, you know, without any additional assumptions, if you have a generic distribution, there's no reason to be able to uh, restrict the distribution to a submanifold. Right? So if you have a distribution that's defined on, well, R2, for example, a two-dimensional torus, there's no reason why you should be able to restrict it to a line. Uh, in particular, and so the problem is that elements of C alpha for alpha negative cannot be uh, restricted to say sub manifold. Um, and the reason is that they actually contain things of the form, um, you know, the function x maps to distance between x and the curve a to some power minus delta. These kind of functions do belong to these spaces. And so this belongs to, um, and now, Okay, I'm not 100% I'm not sure if the delta is really the, the same delta, but I think this basically belongs to C minus delta, or maybe, maybe delta times dimensional divided by dimensional something. But, uh, but basically, you know, you have functions that you have elements of these spaces that do actually blow up on arbitrary curves. And so, you know, if you take a generic element in one of these spaces, you can certainly not expect that to be able to restrict it to a generic curve. Uh, so that's simply not possible. So um, another problem is that, you know, if you just think about the, um, um, you know, your Wilson loop observables, they are going to be sort of holonomies along some kind of curve like this. And now, you know, imagine that everything is approximated by something discrete. And so you would approximate your curve. For example, you could imagine approximating your curve by something like this, right? by some sort of staircase like that, that follows the curve, but stays on some kind of square, epsilon square grid. Right? And then what's the kind of error that you expect, right? So the error that you expect is basically on every little piece of size epsilon in that curve, you might make an error, which is essentially like the difference between, you know, you have a little square of side length epsilon, 
And you sort of look at the difference between the holonomy along this piece of path and the one along this piece of path, right? So typically, if the actual curve sort of goes like that, then you have to choose between this or that. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, um, but then you would want, you know, the error that's induced by your choice. Ideally, you would want you would have wanted that to go to zero, right? As epsilon goes to zero. Um, but now, if you think of a, if a belongs to c, say minus delta, then the curvature f of a would belong to c minus delta minus one, right? Because the curvature is basically a derivative of a. Um, if you can define the curvature, okay? There's a nonlinear term in it, so it's not even clear if you can define it. But if you can define it, then it belongs to c minus delta minus one. Um, and furthermore, it's basically supposed to kind of look like white noise, right? Because the a itself, well, looks like the solution to this equation. The solution to this equation at a fixed moment in time actually looks like a free field in space. And in two dimensions, the derivative of a free field is basically a white noise. Okay, if you take one derivative of a free field, uh, a free field in space, just then that's basically a white noise in space. So you would expect that guy to behave basically in two dimensions. So the discussion here is even just in two dimensions. Okay, so that guy you would expect it to behave like a 2D white noise. But now, what it, you know, if you look at the arrow that you make here, well, that's sort of essentially like the holonomy going around a little loop. But going around a little loop, we've seen that that's, you know, basically by definition of the curvature, that's essentially just the exponential of the curvature, right? So the arrow that you make is essentially the area of the loop times the, the curvature, which is sort of the same as just the surface integral of the curvature on that little square, right? So you expect the error that you make here to be of the same order as what you get if you take a white noise and you sort of integrate it on a little square. Right? But if you take a white noise, right? So the integral of f of a on that little square of size epsilon, well, you'd expect it to behave roughly like a normal random variable with variance epsilon squared. Uh, but that means if the variance is epsilon square, it means that the standard deviation is epsilon. So the size of that thing, right? So the size of this thing is about the size of this thing, which is about epsilon. And now the number of such choices that we make here is of order one over epsilon, right? So if we make the, and they're basically all independent. If this is like a white noise, then all of these guys, you can't really, rely on them being correlated in a nice way, right? Uh, and so what that means is that, you know, if you are deliberately nasty and you somehow, you know, you make just the bad choice, which sort of makes that thing always positive, And I make sort of the opposite choice, which always sort of goes in the other direction. Um, then we're going to construct essentially two approximations that look perfect, like perfectly reasonable approximation of this smooth curve. Um, but our holonomies are going to differ by order one. Right? Actually, they're even going to differ probably by something that diverges logarithmically. Right? So, so that's also a problem that we have to consider, right? So if you want to, so you see that if you, even if you somehow can restrict these elements to curves or to lines or something, uh, you have to be a little bit careful when you define your holonomies about, you know, on what type of curves your holonomies are defined and how stable are they under, you know, changing your curve. Uh, and as we, what this little formal calculation showed you is that it's actually already not stable under this kind of approximation, right? So approximating a diagonal curve by a staircase is actually already a bad approximation. Um, so, 
okay, so the idea is that, um, well, okay, so first the free field itself, that one we can actually restrict it to curves, right? We sort of expect, well, so first if you, uh, I don't know, if you ever read, for example, the paper by Sheffield and Duplantier on the free field, they kind of define multiplicative chaos by restricting the free field on circles uh, and then using the fact that these restrictions on circles have nice properties. Uh, so you can certainly dis restrict a two-dimensional free field to circles. Uh, so actually you can restrict it to any smooth curve. Um, so, so the idea is that maybe um, in your state space, instead of describing your distribution as, you know, the way you normally describe a distribution, which is, you know, you test against test function on the whole space, uh, you basically describe it by its restrictions to all curves. Okay, you just postulate that you give yourself for every curve, you have a guy on the curve. But then, okay, what sort of consistency do you want between these things, right? So you want to describe a by its restriction to curves. Um, and of course, the problem immediately is that, you know, there are many curves. Um, and of course, there's some sort of consistency you want, right? So if you have two curves that sort of coincide for some piece, then of course, on the piece on which they coincide, you want the thing to be the same and so on, right? Uh, so it potentially starts to get super messy. Um, so is there a useful concept of most curves? Uh, yes, well, there will be, well, most curves would just be like smooth curves. Um, of course, what we're going to want is basically like smooth curves. Of course, you will, we want to allow corners. We just don't want to allow too many corners. Right? So like staircases should be fine, but not sequences of staircases approximating a diagonal. Right? So that's the sort of thing we want. Um, so, so next idea is, well, since there are many curves, one thing that there are much less of is lines. Okay? Uh, so then, restrict two lines, right? So there are much less lines than there are curves. Uh, so we could just describe A by its restrictions to all lines. Um, now, of course, then the question is, well, if you know what it does on lines, can you actually recover what it's supposed to do on curves? Uh, of course, you can sort of approximate a curve by pieces of lines, right? But then what's a good way of approximating that? So, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and this whole thing should be, right, the space, we want to build some sort of space of distributions um, in this way. And the space should be large enough that it at least contains the solution to the linear equation, right? So that at least, at least the solution to that equation should belong to our space. Okay? And so what I want to show you today is that in dimension two, you can do that. In dimension three, you can't, or at least we can't. I don't think you can. Um, but in dimension two, you can. And so, so one thing is first you look at the space of line segments. Right? So space of line segments. So now I sort of restrict myself to dimension two. Uh, but actually all of the discussion I'm going to do, I don't think anything really depends on the fact that dimension is two, except for the fact that the very end that the solution of the linear equation belongs to the space that we construct. Right? So that's sort of fail because we're going to construct spaces that depend on an index, the index zero, if you interpret it as some sort of distribution of regularity, but it's not allowed to go too far below uh, and actually it's not going to be, it's not going to be allowed to go sufficiently far below zero uh, to, to catch solution to the linear equation in dimension three. But in dimension two, you just have to go a tiny bit below zero and you're fine. Um, okay, so an element in a line segment 
is just that, right? So it's a starting point uh, and a vector, or if you want a starting point and an endpoint. Um, and let me just call that in general L, and L is just a pair starting point and vector, okay? Or starting point and endpoint. You can describe it whichever way you want. Um, and there's a concatenation operation between these guys provided that, right? So if I have two guys that point in the same direction and so that the starting point of the second guy is exactly the end point of the first one, well, then I can concatenate them, right? So then here in this particular case, if I have L and L bar, then I have a natural operation, which is some sort of concatenation between L and L bar, which gives me just, you know, the guy uh, starting here and with length, the sum of the length of the two. Right? Of course, you can only do that if they point exactly in the same direction. And if the end point of the second guy is exact, uh, if the starting point of the second guy is exactly the end point of the first one. Okay, so it's not defined on the whole space, this operation. It's only defined on these specific pairs. Um, and so now what we want is we look at function. So let me call, let me give this space a name. I don't know, curly L. I don't think I used curly L anywhere. Um, and now we describe a connection A just as a map L to R, uh, which has the property that A of L concatenated with L bar is equal to A of L plus A of L bar. Oh, sorry, in our case, it's not with values in R, of course, it's actually with values in the Lie algebra in our case. Okay, but that doesn't really matter what the target space is. Um, right, so that's, so now what we think of it is A of a line segment, we think of it as basically being the integral of A along that line segment, right? So if A was an actual smooth connection or say continuous or something, uh, which is really just a one form, we view these things as one forms, okay? So if A is a smooth one form, uh, then you can integrate it along curves, um, in particular, you can integrate it along straight lines. And so for every line segment, it gives you a number, which is just the integral of the one form along that line segment, okay? And so now what we're going to do is we just record that collection of numbers, okay? One for each line segment. And they obviously have that consistency relation, right? So if you integrate along that guy and then integrate along that guy and you add it up, that's the same as integrating along uh, the concatenation of the two. Okay, and, th and that's the only consistency that we impose. Um, and uh, okay, so now what we want to do is we want to sort of put norms on these spaces. So for us, there's a natural sort of Helder type norm that you can put on this, which I'm going to denote by a alpha, but GR, GR is, stands for growth. So which really only, it only measures the size, if you want, of the A's. Um, and this by definition is the supremum over all these line segments of A of L divided by the length of the line segment to the power alpha. Okay, so the length of L here by definition is just the length of the so it's just the length of the line segment. Um, okay, so that gives us something like a, some sort of alpha holder type norm. Um, in a way it's kind of shifted by one, right? So in the sense that if, if A as a, as a one form is described by a bunch of continuous functions, then this is going to be true a bound like this is going to hold with alpha equal one, not zero, right? Because if you integrate a continuous function, in particular a bounded function, along a little line segment of length v, then you're going to get something which is bounded by a multiple of v, 
And so therefore you have a bound like this with alpha equal one. Okay, so here, this alpha, if you want, is like sort of shifted by one with respect to this one. Okay. Um, so in the sense that if you have, um, right, so, so if, if we take this alpha to be less than one, that would already correspond to connections of one forms here that are distributions in a way, right? So alpha less than one gives you sort of distributions. Um, so now first, one thing that you can notice is that if, if this A alpha growth is finite uh, for some alpha bigger than a half, then we have a notion of holonomy along straight lines. Right, because what do we want to do along the straight line? What we want to do is we want to solve this equation here, right? Um, but then along our straight line, so now one straight line is really just a lots of concatenations of these little vectors. Right? So this guy is going to be a function. So if I look at it as a function of the endpoint of the vector along my line, uh, that's going to be a function which is alpha holder continuous. And so I have a differential equation here, which with a sort of driving noise, which is this A of dA, uh, which is alpha holder for alpha bigger than a half. Okay, and then I'm I can view this as a young equation and it has unique solutions. Okay, so, um, so if this norm is finite for some alpha strictly bigger than a half, then I can interpret the equation for the holonomies along a straight line in the young sense um, and you know, I can solve it. And this is sort of stable under approximations. Okay, so the solution that I get will depend continuously. This gives me a norm, so I have a topology here and it's going to depend continuously on A. Um, now the problem here is that this really only works for straight lines at this stage. Okay? Uh, and the reason is that in this norm, we haven't said anything about how, you know, if I have a little vector here and then I have another one, which is sort of almost the same, but it just points, you know, it's just next to it or something. I don't know anything about how the A's relate to it, right? So, so this kind of norm tells me nothing about whether, you know, one line segment and another one, which just sits nearby, uh, take values that are similar or not, right? So it doesn't give me any sort of continuity in the line segment. The only continuity it gives me is if I sort of extend the length of my line segment like that, because that's this concatenate that's given by this identity here. Okay, but so that's the only regularity that I've got here. Okay, and so that's why it only defines me holonomies along straight lines, or if you want, along you know finite concatenations of straight lines. Um, now, of course, what we would like is to have Wilson loops, you know, more or less along arbitrary smooth curves, not just straight lines. Um, and so for this, we want some kind of regularity as you move your line segment. Um, and so, so sort of some kind of sideways regularity. And so what we're going to impose is that a alpha say v is finite and that's the supremum. I'm going to tell you in a second what I mean by this. Uh, a of l minus a of l bar 
divided by the area L, L bar to the alpha over two. Okay, and so what I mean here is I look, so that supremum here runs over all pairs of L and L bar that form a V, so in the sense that they look like this, uh, where the length is the same. Okay, so this length here is the same as this length here, the starting point is the same. And they make an angle which is, you know, they don't, you know, they don't sort of look like that. So, so you, you impose some kind of bound on the angle. So for example, here, say you put less than 45 degrees or something, it doesn't really matter what you put. Uh, okay, so you take a supremum of all pairs of L like this and that area here, this area is just, you know, the area spanned by them. So it's just that area here. Okay, and here, well, it doesn't really matter if you put a straight line or if you look at the parallelogram or something, you know, they all just differ by a factor. Okay, but you look at the area here and then in order to make it a length again, you take the square root of that. So that's why here you put an alpha over two rather than an alpha. So it kind of scales in the same way as the other one. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to define omega, oops. Omega alpha is the set of A's such that the alpha norm of A, which by definition is the sum of these two bits. So there's the growth bit and the bit that comes from the V's uh, is finite. And actually what you really want to take is you want to really take the uh, closure of smooth forms under this norm, which is a slightly smaller space. Okay, but I'm not going to discuss the sort of subtleties between these two spaces. Okay, but, um, I th yeah, I think I'm already running over time. So maybe this is a good place to break. Yep, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I can unmute people, but thank you very much. I don't know, should we, are there any questions? A question? Um, sure. Yeah, Martin. Uh, so can you explain what is the, what is the reason of um, restricting to the angle being smaller than 45 degrees? Oh, oh, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't really make much of a difference. But, you know, you don't want to put, like, you don't want, you, you don't want to impose that it goes to zero when the two guys are like that. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just okay. that. Okay, see. Okay. So it could put 90 degrees also. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. But you have to put something. Okay, okay. Thank you. Any other? Oh, uh, is alpha so, bigger than a half enough? Um, no. So we'll see. Well, that's what we'll see after the break. So, so that actually, if you want to restrict these things to smooth curves, uh, it seems that bigger than a half isn't enough. And that's why. We, so the thing is that if if you wanted to do this in dimension three, then you would want to take alpha equal a half, or actually alpha slightly less than a half. Um, but it turns out what we'll see is that, you know, you really want to take alpha bigger than two thirds, unfortunately. Okay, so we have six minutes before we resume. Thank you mention is you of course you want um uh i guess this is maybe a crawl okay so one corollary of this right and this is that if you have two segments if you invert the segment then a has to change sign right because if you concatenate a segment to the same segment pointing in the other direction, you get the segment of zero length and that one A has to be zero because of that, right? So A is sort of zero on segments of zero length. And so now if you have any two guys, right? So if you have two segments, uh, like one like this, and then another one like this, 
which are not coplanar and don't even have the same starting point or anything, I can always just sort of put a third one in here. Right? And then my notion of regularity here. So this notion of regularity tells me that this guy has to be close to minus this guy, but it also has to be close to minus this guy. Uh, and therefore, uh, this guy has to be close, this guy has to be close to that one. Right. So it does really give you a good notion of sideways regularities. Okay, so shall we resume? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so one thing, for example, that that you can get from this, um, that's really a dimension two thing, is that if you take two triangles, for example, uh, so you take like a triangle like this, and then another triangle sort of say like this, um, and then you look at the, now there's a natural way of saying what you mean by A of the boundary of the triangle, because the boundary of the triangle is just three segments, and then you just add them up. Um, and if you have two such triangles with the same orientation, right, so it's like that, uh, and you compare A along one of them to A along the other one, then this is bounded by that alpha norm of A times the area of the symmetric difference between the two to the alpha over two, right? Which basically means just like these bits of area. And so you have that kind of result. Okay? So it, it does actually control that, to, that type of thing. So, so now one can actually use this to extend A to regular curves. And for this, I want to have a, you know, a notion of regularity for my curves. And the natural thing, I mean, of course, there's a natural notion of, you know, a curve is just a function from an interval into your RD. And so there's a regularity, which is whatever the hold of regularity or the usual C alpha type regularity or Sobolev or something. Um, here in this context, it's natural to look for a notion of regularity that's parametrization invariant, right? Because we, what we want to do is just rest restricting to the image of the curve or integrating along the curve. But these are all operations that don't care about how you parametrize the curve, right? So you want some sort of notion of regularity that doesn't actually care uh, which way you parametrize your curve. Um, and, and it needs to be a sort of higher order notion. So for example, a natural notion of regularity that doesn't care about parametrization is the P variation rule of regularity. But that's clearly too weak because the, the most regular variation type regularity is one variation. Uh, and, you know, one variation, or at least any p variation bigger than one would be perfectly fine with that sort of approximation to a smooth curve, right? And we've seen that that kind of approximation would be bad for us. Uh, so we want sort of higher order regularities that are in some sense like p variation for p less than one. Right? So that's the sort of thing we would want. Um, and so, so it turns out one natural way of doing it is the following. So you take a curve, say A. Um, now for any two points, say S, T on your curve, you look at all the points in between, say your U. Uh, and now what you do is you look at all the triangles and you look at the size of these triangles, but in terms of area. Okay, so you look at the area of these triangles. Um, and so let me call that triangle P S U T. So that's just the triangle formed by the three vertices. Um, and then if I put an absolute value around it, that's just going to be its area. Um, 
And so now you can define some kind of variation norm. Oh, maybe let's use A again. Um, let me use alpha again as the supremum of all partitions of say zero one of the sum over all elements of my partition. So here, this guy, this is a partition of say zero one and I view A as a map from zero one into RD or torus or whatever. Um, and then what I do here is I look at the supremum over the U's in ST of the area of PSUT to the alpha over two. Okay. So, um, so what do we have? So if, if A is Lipschitz, or say one variation of that, okay? Um, then what we get is that, well, you know, if we chop it up into little intervals of size DT, the best we can say about that triangle is that it's going to be of area about DT square. Uh, and so if I want that sum to be finite as sort of DT goes to zero, then my DT square have to take a square root, so I would take alpha equal one, right? So then a one is finite. But if A is smooth, then I have something better because then my little triangle is going to be very flat, right? So if A is a smooth curve and I have a little triangle made up of three points on A uh, and they're only about delta T apart, then in that time interval delta T, A will have moved its direction by about delta T only. And therefore the width of my triangle is going to be of order delta T squared at most, right? And that means that the area of my triangle is going to be a delta T cubed. Um, and so I can take it to the power two thirds, uh, to the power one third, um, and it's still summable, right? And so alpha can be of size two thirds, so here. I have a two thirds less than finite, right? So the, the meaningful values of alpha here are the values between two thirds and one, okay? In the sense that I'm never, this, I can never expect, the only way I would expect this to be finite for some alpha less than two thirds is if my line is just a straight line basically, right? So if it's a straight line, then the triangles are all area zero, and then this is finite, whatever alpha is. But as soon as it's not a straight line or, or not mostly a straight line, um, right? So it could be like piecewise a straight line. And then of course, again, all the alphas would be, uh, for all alphas is fine, right? But if you have a function, which is not just piecewise affine, um, then you can never expect this alpha norm to be finite for alpha less than two thirds, right? So two thirds is sort of like the, the smallest one that you can take. Um, on the other hand, bigger than one is sort of useless. That would always be, right? So as soon as you have a Lipschitz function, um, then, uh, well, you get to alpha equal to one. And we already seen in the discussion that we don't care about regularities below that, right? Because we certainly want at least Lipschitz. And so we see alpha between two thirds and one. Well, basically it gives you a way, it's a parametrization independent way of measuring regularity, which is sort of roughly somewhere between Lipschitz and C2. Okay. Um, so actually you can make that more precise. Ooh, maybe I didn't. I have the notes somewhere. Um, I mean, you can you can show that if you have a function, um, if a in some parametrization, 
belongs to C two over alpha um, and then minus one, then this A alpha is finite. Okay, and so you see that for alpha equal to two thirds, uh, that should give you two, right? Because two over two thirds is three, minus one is two, and alpha equal one gives you two over one is two, minus one is one, right? So it basically interpolates between C1 and C2, kind of. Um, but it's a, but of course, this is not parametrization independent, whereas this is parametrization independent. Uh, and now the claim is that if you have a curve like this, so, so a proposition, if you want, is if A, say alpha bar is finite and A alpha is finite, for alpha bar bigger than alpha, um, then A restricts to A. Uh, and furthermore, if I sort of, if I integrate A along A, so restricting to A really means that I have a notion of integration of the one form capital A along the curve A. And so if I integrate along the curve, I get a function. And then the regularity of that function, so let me let me call say um, A of A sort of right, T maps to A of A T, that one has finite one over alpha bar variation. Okay, so which you can think of basically alpha bar holder continuous. So in some parametrization, it's alpha bar holder. Okay, so, so I'm not going to, it's not very difficult to prove actually. Um, I'm not going to go into details because we don't really have time, but you know, the idea is the usual kind of thing, right? So you, you have your curve and now you want to approximate it by piecewise affine, things, right? So what you do is you just approximate it by something piecewise affine, right? So, so you approximate it like that. And now you refine that approximation. So say, for example, you take a dyadic approximation or something, and now you refine it uh, and then you try to estimate the error between one level of approximation and the next, right? And you see the error that you make between, you know, this approximation, uh, between this approximation and this one is going to be exactly somehow the, you know, how much you get when you go around that little triangle with A. But here, this tells us that going around the little triangle with A, I can take here the zero triangle, right? And in particular, it tells me that A going around the triangle gives me a contribution which is proportional to the area of the triangle to the power alpha over two. And then to, this basically matches, you know, the way I've defined my notion of regularity here that then allows me to sort of, you know, show that the total contribution that you get, uh, as long as the alpha bar is bigger than alpha, then you end up with some sort of a geometric series. And so that sums up. And so you get a finite total contribution. And so you see that these, uh, this sequence of approximations actually converges to a nice limit. Okay, so that's uh, not very difficult to prove. Uh, I think the main contribution here is to come up with the correct definitions, right? So then once you have defined things correctly, it's not very difficult to actually prove them. Um, okay, so you just do a little, it's just an approximation argument. Um, now, that tells me that 
now you see this of course only works right so here we had to take alpha bar bigger than alpha okay? and here we've seen that the smallest reasonable alpha is two-thirds uh, so if alpha is less than two-thirds curves a that have sort of this alpha norm finite are actually just piecewise r finite right? so they are not interesting in that sense okay so if we want to restrict to arbitrary at least arbitrary smooth curves um, then the lowest we can go down in terms of regularity for a here is two-thirds so the remark uh, sort of need a alpha finite for some alpha bigger than two thirds to to get say holonomies for example for let's say along smooth curves. Okay, but if, so if that norm is finite for some alpha bigger than two thirds, um, then this gives a as a way of actually, even though A a priori is defined only on line segments, uh, there's a consistent way of actually defining it on arbitrary smooth curves, where smooth is smooth in this sense. Okay. Uh, and then again, as before, since, uh, since as part of this proposition, we have a bound here on the variation of that guy, and it's really just the variation that comes from that norm here. As soon as this is bigger than a uh, smaller than two, right? Uh, right, which means alpha bar bigger than a half. So as soon as alpha bar is bigger than a half, uh, you have a notion of holonomy because you just get an ODE that you can solve. You get an ODE with a driver that's hold a continuous uh, of index bigger than a half, and so it has pathwise solutions. Okay. Um, so, so now we have a reasonable state space. Um, and it turns out, so first, well, I'm going to just claim that this is true. Right? So, so there's a proposition, uh, which is that um, solutions to stochastic heat equation, so just a linear version of our equation, uh, take values in these spaces omega alpha uh, almost surely for every alpha less than one and this is in dimension two okay so in particular, alpha less than one, you can take some alpha that's bigger than two thirds. Right? So now you can take an alpha, which is somewhere between two thirds and one. Um, and then you have a, you know, you have a state space on which you have Wilson loop observables because you've defined holonomies for arbitrary smooth curves. And on the other hand, it also contains the solution to the stochastic heat equation. So when I mean containing so what i mean by containing solution to the stochastic heat equation is well if you regularize your noise in any way you want you just hit it with a modifier then you get something smooth um, a smooth one form it's clear how to interpret it as an element of one of these omega alphas so for every line segment you just integrate it along that line segment okay um, and the claim is that then if you send the modifier to zero, this converges to a limiting random variable in this omega alpha, and the random variable you get doesn't actually depend on the modifier or anything, okay? Or you can construct it directly by Kolmogorov extension and 
you know, you can sort of do it more axiomatically and you get the same random variable. Does it mean that solution to the, yes. Uh, so, so it's a continuous, so you can view the, you can view it as a continuous stochastic process. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you can have, say, you could have, I suppose, some sort of held regularity in time, but at least you get certainly continuity in time with values uh, in that omega alpha. Now, at this stage, we don't, in a way, we don't care too much about time regularity since the, well, I mean, the, the idea would be, you know, ideally you would want to show that, you know, you can construct a process in the end that has an invariant measure, and then that invariant measure would be the young Mills measure that you're after. Um, but in that measure, there's no time anymore, right? It's just the invariant measure for the process, but that would be a measure on that space. So this would be a nice state space for that measure. Um, but now, uh, so I'm not going to prove this. So the, you can prove it basically by Kolmogorov continuity test also, right? I mean, this, the space of line segments with that funny distance, I mean, this is essentially some sort of form of Holder regularity. I can view this as a distance between line segments. Um, and then I can just apply Kolmogorov continuity test also, or something like that, some version of it. Um, so one thing, however, is that we want to know, well, how that space behaves under gauge transformation, right? So how does the gauge group act on that space? Or is there a good action of the gauge group? Right? So of course, yes, for the smooth, um, elements of the gauge group, it's probably not too difficult to sort of figure out how it should act on that space, just by, again, by figuring out how it, how it acts on smooth connections and then sort of, you know, taking limits. Um, but then the problem is that if you just take smooth elements, you know, smooth functions with values in your, in your group G, um, and then you look at, you define gauge orbit simply as, um, you know, everywhere you can take A by acting on it with a smooth element, then there's no reason for these gauge orbits to be closed, for example. Right? Um, and so then the space of equivalent classes would be some kind of horrible space, right? It doesn't have any sort of reasonable topology. I mean, it has a topology, which is the quotient topology. Uh, but that quotient topology would be absolutely horrible, right? It would be a little bit similar to what happens when you, you know, you can act on L2 functions by smooth functions by simply addition, right? So that's an action of a smooth group on a space, which is L2. And then you can, quote, you can look at the orbits, but now the orbits are L2 functions quotiented by smooth functions. So two L2 functions are equivalent if they differ by a smooth function. Of course, you can take now, you know, that space of equivalence classes uh, and put, you have a topology on it, which is sort of the quotient topology that descends from L2, but that's a completely horrible space, right? I mean, it's a, it doesn't have any sort of property. And it's not a Borel space or anything. So you can't do probability theory with that space. Um, and so the same thing would happen here if you simply quotient, right? So if I simply take omega alpha and I quotient by G where these are smooth functions, say from R2 into, into G, then that would be an absolutely horrible space. Right. The orbits would not be closed. There would be uh, the quotient topology would be horrible. Uh, so you can't do any probability on that space. Yeah. So the question is, you know, can I make the gauge group say a bit larger than smooth functions, for example, uh, in such a way that the quotient is nice? Um, and well, so it turns out that you can. And so a natural thing is to look at say G beta, which is defined as, well, just the functions from, right? So it's the little G's that go from say R2 to G that are in C beta. 
at the Ofeldo regularity C beta. And actually, again, there is this subtlety that it's not quite the same as closing smooth functions under the Holder norm. So I'm going to always just take the closure of smooth functions under the Holder, under some completion of smooth functions under the norms that this gives you um, of distance as well. So, so this is a kind of reasonable space. Um, it turns out that, so first, if you take so the proposition uh, is that if you take alpha in zero one and beta in two thirds one, so that the minimum, bit, so that alpha plus beta over two and alpha over two plus beta are both bigger than one, then there's actually a continuous action, right? So then uh, a g maps to g times a uh, is continuous from sort of omega alpha times g beta into omega alpha minimum beta. Okay, so so here. Um, well, I know how this action works if these guys are smooth, okay? So if G is a smooth function and A is a smooth one form, then we already know what this means. Um, and then it turns out smooth one forms are dense in that space, or at least, you know, I can actually just look at only the uh, completion of the smooth guys somehow in that space. Uh, and therefore, if I know how this acts on the smooth guys, then I also know how it acts on everything, pro provided that things are sufficiently uniformly continuous. Right? And the claim here is that it is locally uniformly continuous. Um, and in general, if beta, right, so if beta is less than alpha, then you might lose in terms of regularity. That's kind of reasonable, but it turns out that the ways of measuring regularity here are really compatible in the sense that if beta is less than if beta is equal to alpha, then you don't lose, you get back to the same space. And if beta is less than alpha, then you really just end up in that omega beta space. Okay. Um, that's not obvious, right? Because the way that we've defined these omega beta spaces, it doesn't quite look like Holder norms. I, I mean, it looked a little bit like Holder norms. So at least the first bit looked very much like a type of Holder norm, but that's actually more like a supremum norm. The second bit was also like some sort of Holder norm, but only for some specific pairs of line segments. Uh, so it's not completely clear that this is the case, right? Um, but it turns out that, that you can show that this is true, uh, provided that, right, so there are some restrictions on the alphas and the betas here. But again, well, typically you would want to take alpha equal to beta here, right? Because that guarantees that you end up in the same space again. Uh, and then you see again, if alpha, if you want to take alpha equal to beta, um, well, then basically you need to be bigger than two thirds. Right? Well, because beta needs to be bigger than two thirds anyway. And then this condition, if alpha is big equal to beta, then it precisely says that you, you need to be bigger than two thirds as well. Right, so then this actually becomes kind of um, redundant. Okay, so two thirds is really a natural thresh threshold here for various statements. Um, okay, so, so this ends up being a continuous operation. Um, and now the claim is that so that sort of goes one way. Uh, but the claim is that if I take beta equal to alpha, then this really sort of goes both ways in the sense that the uh, gauge orbits are actually closed. Okay. All right, so if beta is, if this space is too small, right, so if elements in that space are too smooth, then in general, gauge orbits have no reason to be closed. Right, so like in the way, like if I take C infinity acting on L2, uh, then the orbit of zero would be C infinity, which is a dense subset of L2, it's not closed, right? 
Uh, so the same sort of thing would happen here if you take that space too small. Uh, if you take it too big, then of course it just kicks you out of your space, the action, right? That's what happens here. If you take beta less than alpha, then this space is too big and the action here actually just kicks you out of your space. Um, the claim is that if beta is equal to alpha, then it's just right in the sense that not only does the action preserve your space, but the gauge orbits are actually closed. Okay, that's a non-trivial fact. Um, and the reason why the gauge orbits are closed, so the claim is that um, the orbits of the action of G alpha onto omega alpha are closed. Well, if we've seen already alpha is bigger than two thirds. Okay. Uh, and actually even more, um, furthermore, so if I define say O alpha to be the quotient space, so that's now my space of orbits. Um, and it has a topology, which is just the topology that comes from omega alpha. Uh, then this is a Polish space. So it's a complete separable metric space. So it's a nice space to do probability theory on. Okay. Um, and so in particular, uh, the claim then is going to be that in two dimensions, not only do the linear, um, the linearized solutions, the solutions to a stochastic heat equation belong to the space omega alpha, but you can give a meaning to the solutions to the stochastic Young-Mills equations as a process in omega alpha. And then that process is gauge equivariant. And one way of saying that it's gauge equivariant is to say that it actually gives you a Markov process on the space of gauge orbits, right? Not just, so it gives you a Markov process. Is in general, you have a Markov process on omega alpha, but now you do a projection, right? So you do a quotient space. So in general, quotienting doesn't preserve the Markov property at all, right? So if you have a Markov property process on R2 and you just look at the first component, there's no way that it's going to be Markov in general, right? Um, but here, gauge invariance, one way of formulating gauge invariance uh, is to say that, well, if you project onto that space of gauge orbits, you preserve the Markov property. Okay, so you get actually a nice Markov process on that space here. Um, and so there's a hope that it would have an invariant measure on that space. And then that would be your Young-Mills measure. Okay, but we cannot prove that, unfortunately. Um, okay, so let me, okay, so we have how much do I have? 10 minutes left. Um, so, okay, so let me just give you an idea of how you prove this. Um, so of course it really relies on that formula that we had, right? So recall that if say A bar is G acting on A, uh, then we have a formula we can recover G by G of Y being the holonomy of A bar along some trajectory AXY that connects X to Y. Right, so, so we've seen this uh, yesterday. So we had that formula that recovers uh, the J, the G, if we know the G at one fixed point and we know A bar and A. Okay, and so we have here a formula that recovers the G. Um, and now basically all you need to check here is that if 
we know that both A and A bar are in this space omega alpha, then the G that we recover with this formula is in C alpha. Um, and that's basically enough. And so actually what one can show is that you have that this is true, right? So you have a bound of the form, so it's even sort of Lipschitz. So you have a bound of the form that the C alpha norm of G uh, is bounded by some multiple of the, and here you only need that growth norm even, plus bar alpha growth, right? But that of course is bounded by just the A alpha plus A bar alpha. Um, and so that's in actually for this, I think you only need alpha bigger than a half. Um, and this essentially comes from the results that I already, already mentioned just early on, right? Is that if you, you know, this tells you um, the fact that A and A bar are in these spaces that actually tells you that the holonomy along, so in general, if alpha is less than two thirds, then you, only, you can only do holonomies along straight lines, but that's good enough, right? So you just take the holonomy along the straight line that connects X to Y. Um, and if, uh, if this growth norm here is finite, then the holonomy of A along a curve going from X to Y is going to be bounded by X minus Y to the alpha. And that really just comes from Young integration theory, right? Because you just solve that ODE, it's a nice, there's a nice ODE with a driver that has regularity alpha. And so the solution has regularity alpha and therefore uh, this guy, and so you get a bound here that this guy is roughly bounded by X minus Y to the alpha times A, this growth norm. Okay, and then there's a similar bound I mean, in the sense that, of course, the holonomy is, I mean, bounded in the sense of being close to the identity, right? So it's not, it's, right, this is a group element. So it's not like, so being bounded here means close to the, the distance from the identity is bounded by this. So this guy is close to the identity. This guy is close to the identity by the, about the same amount with A replaced by A bar. And therefore this guy is close to this guy by you know, the same sort of amount and that gives you the, the holder bound that you want. Okay, so this is, a, this is actually quite easy to show. Um, and then if you want to show, so that kind of tells you that the gauge orbits are closed. Um, but then of course that doesn't quite tell you that's not really sufficient to guarantee uh, that the quotient space is nice somehow. Um, for example, if the gauge orbits like went too far from each other at infinity, then that space would sort of behave badly. Uh, so remember these gauge orbits, they are not compact in any sense, right? So the gauge group here is a group of holder functions. So it's not at all something compact, so it's something so it's a very, very large set. It's a sort of very large infinite dimensional set. Um, but what we show is that in some sense this set, it doesn't, it doesn't intersect bounded balls in this space too often. Like, like if you take an element of omega alpha and then you act on it with a guy in G alpha that has a very large holder norm, right? Then that's actually going to take you very far out in omega alpha, right? So what you want to show is that you cannot like get back to the origin, right? By acting on an element near the origin with an element in G alpha, which is very large. Um, and that's what this bound tells you. Right, this tells you if, you if you take a guy which is not too large and then you act on it with an element which is very large, 
then this guy has to be large. Right? Then the guy that you get has to become large. Right? If this guy is large and this guy is small, then this one has to be large. Right? So it tells you that if you take large elements in your gauge group, they have to actually move you far out. And that's the thing that guarantees that the quotient space is nice. Right? So the typical kind of spaces where quotient spaces are bad are think of the real line acting on the two-dimensional torus by some sort of irrational slope. So then orbits are you know, a copy of the line that sort of winds back and back and it sort of comes back near, each, near itself uh, infinitely often and closer and closer. And that gives you orbits that are not closed and that gives you horrible quotient spaces. Right? Whereas here, this kind of bound guarantees that this cannot happen here. Okay, things, things really sort of spread out in a nice way. Um, okay, so, the, uh, so what we can do is actually, we can really build an explicit distance. So you can actually build a distance. You can build a nice distance. On, on the space of orbits. Um, and you know what we, you would normally want to do, so an orbit now is a closed set. So a natural distance between closed sets is the Hausdorff distance, right? Of course, the problem is that the Hausdorff distance is kind of nice between compact sets uh, and these sets are not compact. Uh, but still you can kind of, you know, you can define the, how the definition of the Hausdorff distance still works. Uh, and it's just not guaranteed that it's complete. Right? It's not even guaranteed that it's finite, right? So if two orbits, right, if they sort of did something like this, uh, then here the Hausdorff distance would sort of, you know, get arbitrarily large because you sort of move far out here and then the distance to any point here uh, gets very large. And then you take a supremum of all of these guys and the supremum becomes infinite, right? So that sort of thing would be bad. Um, and the claim is that now what you do is you first, you build a distance on omega alpha, which gives you the same topology, but which sort of shrinks things at infinity, which then guarantees that what I was just afraid of doesn't happen because you just artificially shrink things at infinity. Okay, that kind of guarantees that then that when you define your house of distance, it really comes kind of from the bulk and not from the behavior at infinity. Okay, so you kind of shrink distances at infinity for omega alpha. Uh, and so one way of doing that, for example, is I can define say k alpha between two one forms A and B as being, okay, so here that's, there's a slightly crazy expression. Um, but the point here is the following. So this here, th this is not quite a distance, but then you turn it into a distance by just saying the actual distance between two guys, it doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality, but then you turn it into a distance by just saying it's the inf over all, you know, sort of like you take a sequence that connects A to B and then you sort of sum your K alpha Right, so what I mean here is you take a bunch of Zs so that the first Z is A, the last one is B, uh, and then you just sum these guys from one Z to the next and you take the inf of all ways of doing this and then basically by construction, this becomes a distance. Um, and this guy is going to be basically of the same order as that guy, but it's now a proper distance that satisfies triangle inequality and everything. Okay, so you should really think of this guy as behaving the same as that guy. And the point here is that, okay, in terms of topology, if A and B are close, then what really counts here is that you have the distance between A and B. So it really behaves just like the alpha norm. 
right? So it's just this term here that counts when A and B are very close to each other. Um, but then this term here shrinks distances at infinity, right? So if A and B are both very large, then this becomes very large. And so it sort of shrinks the distances between the guys. Uh, so it kind of guarantees that if you take a shell, uh, like if you, if you take different guys that have the same alpha norm, then the diameter of that shell is very small, becomes small in some sense as you go out uh, instead of becoming large. Right? Um, sort of like the boundaries of the balls of, of very large balls, the boundaries become actually small in this distance. Okay. Uh, but then different shells still stay relatively far away, right? So it doesn't just squash everything to a point at infinity, right? It does, it's not like a sort of one point compactification type thing. Um, so it still, it still keeps shells away. So like if you take a guy of norm uh, 1 billion and then another guy of norm 2 billion, they are not going to be close to each other in this distance. But if you take two guys of norm one billion, they're going to be close to each other. Okay. So that's sort of what this distance does. Um, and then what you do is you take for on omega, uh, on O alpha, you take the Hausdorff distance. for this K alpha, okay? Um, and then the reason why you don't get much contribution from infinity and why this is finite uh, is because if you take any A and B, they have some sort of finite alpha norm in this omega alpha space. Um, and then if you take any number larger than their norm, you will be able to find a gauge transformation that creates something of that with a norm of that size, right? Because you can always sort of, uh, you know, like ring things around in such a way that then you get very large oscillations, right? Your gauge transformation, they sort of act by bringing things around. Uh, so you can immediately create, so it's very easy to create large holder norms, right? So it's easy to create large oscillations. Um, and that means that it, when you compare two gauge orbits. Now in your gauge orbits, there's going to be bits far out, but if there's a guy of very large norm in this gauge orbit, there will be a guy of the same norm in the other gauge orbit. And two guys of the same very large norm, they are actually very close to each other in this distance, right? And then that means that they don't, that bit doesn't really contribute much to the Hausdorff distance. Right? And so that's, that's why this distance is sort of engineered to guarantee that the contribution from the Hausdorff distance really just comes from the order one bits and not from sort of bizarre behavior somewhere out of infinity. Uh, and that's why then it's, you know, it turns this into a nice distance uh, that actually turns this guy, that is actually complete uh, for, you know, for the topology that you've got on that guy. Uh, and so then that turns this into a nice sort of Polish space, right? So you have a nice separable metric on it. Um, okay, I think I'm, yeah, I'm sort of out of time. So maybe just a very last remark. This works very nicely in dimension two, right? And so the, the main reason was that we had to, in dimension three, uh, the solution to the stochastic key equation has regularity Right, so in dimension two, we've seen it has essentially regularity zero. Um, right, so one minus two over two is zero. In dimension three, you get one minus three over two, which is minus a half. And minus a half here would really correspond to alpha equal to plus a half, right? Because it, this here is really sort of like integrated up once because you integrate along lines. Uh, so in dimension three, you would somehow want to take alpha equal to plus a half, uh, but you can't do that because all of these nice properties required alpha bigger than two thirds. The other problem is in dimension three, even the free field cannot actually be restricted to lines. 
Okay, so in dimension two, the free field can be restricted to lines. In dimension three, it can be restricted to surfaces, but it cannot be restricted to lines. It's just borderline cannot. I mean, like if it was slightly more regular, you could, but it, but you can't. Okay. Um, so it means in dimension three, we can still construct a state space, which has, so now it doesn't have Wilson loop observables, uh, but it has some kind of smoothened Wilson loop observables. Um, but it's okay, it's kind of a much less nice complete picture than what we have in dimension two. Okay, so I think I should stop here for today. Thank you. Um, uh, can we please thank Martin? Unmute yourself so if you can. I don't know if I, think I you have to unmute. <laughs> Okay, are there any questions? Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, you just mentioned this smoothing Wilson loops in higher dimensions. Uh, are they these lassos that people introduced before? Or these are different things. No, what we do is you, you basically well, what you do is you want to actually, we smoothen the other way around, we smoothen the connection. So we're just, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so what you could do is you can just stick the connection into the deterministic young Mills flow. Mm -hmm. right? And that one is smoothing. Uh, so then if you, even if you start with something bad, it becomes smooth immediately. And then you can take a Wilson loop observable, right? So then that's some sort of a smoothened mm -hmm. Wilson loop of observable. The problem there is that actually even that, so the gradient, uh, that equation here, right? So if you just take the deterministic version of this equation, so you just take this and you forget about this bit, right? so then it's a perfectly nice parabolic equation. But still, you know, you want to start with a distribution as your initial condition, and it's a distribution of degree minus a half, and minus a half is actually just the borderline so that this term, these kind of transport terms, right? So if A is of regularity minus a half, then the derivative would be of regularity minus three half. If you multiply it by A again, if you can somehow make sense of that product, that would be of regularity minus two. Uh, and that sort of tells you that when you hit this with the heat kernel, you end up with something that's potentially non-integrable in time. Okay. Okay. So even that deterministic equation minus a half is the borderline on which you can make sense of it. Okay, so, so you cannot make sense of solution to this equation with an initial condition in C minus a half, um, but anything above. And the solution to the stochastic equation is just below mm -hmm. minus a half, okay? Uh, and so there you need to already find a space. So you, so you use ideas again, sort of like from rough parts and so, you actually enhance your thing by something that corresponds to this term here, which annoys you. Um, and that allows you to give a meaning to the solution to the deterministic equation. Right? But you cannot take as your actual state space just some C alpha for alpha less than minus a half, because if you take a generic element in C alpha for less, alpha less than minus a half, you cannot even solve the deterministic equation. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there uh, other questions? Because I had another one. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yes, so uh, you mentioned, Martin, that um, uh, there's uh, exactly one choice of renormalization that uh, will give you um, some equivariant uh, evolution, right? Mm -hmm. that, uh, so, yeah. Uh, and I mean, so is it a kind of a miracle or is it a heuristic? Uh, you have a heuristic explanation why. Uh, um, no, it, in a way, it's, it's clear that there cannot really be more than one. Uh, so it, it could have been that there's none, right? So in some sense, it's a miracle that there is one. Uh, but the fact that it's exactly one is, is sort of obvious. I mean, in the sense that it, it couldn't be, if there was more than one, that would be sort of in contradiction with the fact that the uh, 
Young Mill's energy is the only thing that you can write down, which is gauge invariant, right? Because it means that, you know, that additional term would maybe come again from some sort of gauge invariant uh, energy, right? And you know that they don't exist. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll ask my question offline, so it's, it doesn't matter. Okay, any other? Okay, thank you very much again. I don't know if we should clap or not. I, I don't know the protocol yet, it seems. <laughs> uh, somebody should give me directions, you know. Sometimes I follow directions, who knows. Okay, so we have a break, I guess, of 